Opening merchant interface. Scanning trade routes. Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. 7 tons of Cepheus Deluxe Rule Books and 9 tons of Quantum Starfarer Rule Books, destined for New Eden. Contacting Omegol and Joel of Stellagama Publishing for more information. Stand by. Greetings, fellow sci fi gaming enthusiasts. Today we have a special treat for you on our podcast. We are excited to be joined by Omer Golan Joel, an accomplished game designer hailing from Israel. With a wealth of experience in the industry, Omer is the mastermind behind fan favorite RPGs like Terra Arisen, Barbaric, and Quantum Starfarer. He's a regular at our annual Traveler Mayday Mayday event. And we're thrilled to have him back for the fifth year in a row. In this interview, we'll be delving into Omer's creative process, exploring his latest projects, and gaining valuable insights into the ever-evolving world of tabletop RPGs. So sit back, relax, and join us for a fascinating conversation with Omer Golan Joel. Welcome, Omer. Thank you very much. So uh, what have you been up to in the past year since we've seen you? We published several books. Uh, first and foremost, Cephas Deluxe and uh -huh. Edition. Yes. Uh, which was on Kickstarter uh -huh. for a while. And it uh, replaced the old book with a full color book with all deck plans of all starships included. Oh, cool. And uh, edited errata and everything uh, to make it the best version possible. Published last December. And uh, we published a Quantum Starfarer which is a lightweight science fiction role-playing game based okay. on the quantum engine by the way today i, pub I published the second edition of uh, cepheus quantum the hmm. two page rule set oh so all, it a bit. everything with the word quantum on it is a uh, rules light basically yes it's an okay. engine it's an mm -hmm. engine called the quantum engine it evolved in a secondary way from cepheus but it's not cepheus it's a skill based without attributes very simple very rules light even the most complex version of it called super powered is 185 pages mm, they just no. pages if you if you use american measurements why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself um uh, how you got into uh tabletop gaming how you first became interested in the hobby stuff like that uh, i first encountered the dungeons and dragons advanced dungeons and dragons second edition back in 1997 i think or 1998 back then it was out of print in israel and getting it from abroad wasn't as easy as it is today there was already some sort of online ordering, but uh, it was very expensive. So we used second-hand books, some of them photocopied even, not the original books. Only mm -hmm. the three core books, it was a blast. Simply playing Dungeons and Dragons, the simplest version of second edition, and learning from there. Then I encountered Shadowrun, which was also translated, and also out of print, by the way. Oh, by, okay. Uh, by the time I encountered it also second-hand book uh, which is all was also mind-blowing because it was first time i saw a role-playing game which was not dungeons and dragons which was skill-based and everything like that it, it simply opened my mind to other systems and from there i encountered traveler which i bought from the same guy importing uh, shadow one out of the trunk of his car <laughs> hey yes. kid hey kid you want to buy some books he was simply driving around because he, he came to conventions, he was driving around, you could call him, and uh, when he was in your area, you could meet him, and he will sell you the books. Mm -hmm. It was primitive back then. <laughs> it, was very, it was a very dark period, you could say, in terms <laughs> of, uh, of publishing, of role-playing game publishing in Israel. It was between the time we had the big publisher publishing Dungeons and Dragons, who went bankrupt, oh. and the time we got the third edition. I see. Which open, open up in the early 2000s, which open up the hobby to additional people. I was going to say that's a, an interesting transition and kind of a smooth segue from playing D&D &D to Shadowrun, which is like half D&D, &D, half cyberpunk, right? Kind of sci-fi, yeah. but it also has fantasy races. And then mm -hmm. and then eventually kind of just going full sci-fi into the Traveler. And I like, I like that progression. <laughs> I was interested, interested in sci-fi, but uh, there were no games back then available 
playable to me. Closest thing was Shadowrun, which is it is cyberpunk with some fantasy elements. You could take it to full blown fantasy. Its, its core is very cyberpunk. For some reason, they chose to translate trust this system, which was very interesting. Again, Classic Traveler clicked with me simply. I read all the old sci-fi books and novels from the 60s and 70s, which was what was available back then, for the most part. It clicked with me immediately. I understand the concepts. It took some time to understand the unpack the entire system because it was a big reprint. A friend of mine called it VCR manual because it was, you know, without art, without anything. The eight books in one reprint that mm-hmm. they got. Uh, but it was extremely easy for me to get into it and to run it. It's easier than D and D. It's a very simple system. Uh, it's core just with all the additions added later in the later course of the Classic Traveler. They added complexity, but the basic core is extremely simple. It's almost free form. Did you follow and keep up to date with different editions, or did you stay? Did you find a, a, an edition of Traveler that you kind of liked and parked yourself there? I started with Classic Traveler. I stayed with it until 2008, mm-hmm. then switched to Mongoose Traveler. And then in 2016, I moved uh, to my own system. Which, uh, originally, it was the Cepheus engine by Samardan Press, but uh, later Cepheus Lite, because for the affair surrounding the uh, second edition of uh, Mongoose Traveler. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting into details now, but there were, were is- uh, licensing issues, and uh, if you wanted to publish, you could either go through the community content program, which was not very uh, comfortable for us as publishers, or use our own system based on the SRD, on the open gaming license. Mm-hmm. Now we might be getting back, we are likely to get to be getting back to publishing material for Mongoose Traveler because there will probably be a license soon permitting us to publish comparable material, so we are very happy with it. This this uh, came into being following the OGL deb- debacle two months ago. What inspired you to kind of um, start your own publishing company? What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you first uh, became a publishing company? Originally, I was writing all kinds of fan material for years, I think 10 years. So, of course, it was very simple technically because I was doing layout, if you could call it layout, in uh, Microsoft Word. Publishing meant that I had to cope with being a business and doing my own sales work and doing layout work. Originally, I got some help for that, but uh, it was for part of it was expensive. Uh, so I taught myself how to do layout, which I'm doing at a reasonable level, I think. And of course, it meant investing in art, later finding public domain art of our books. Again, which is a very good thing because then we could transfer the savings to our customers and uh, price our uh, titles at a very low, low level. Other than when you go through Kickstarter and then you have a budget, you could pay for art. But uh, one of our points is to provide affordable books. It's good for everyone. It's good for us because uh, more people buy affordable books. And good for the customer who get cheap and have an affordable material. You don't have to take a mortgage to pay for the, the entire system. Yeah, I remember that was a big barrier to, to entry for me when I was a kid. You know, the D&D books were 25, 35 bucks. The Traveler yeah. Starter Set was 25 or 35 bucks. Um, and, you know, you had to save up, you know, use birthday money or whatever to uh, to get that stuff. And uh, I, I noticed that your prices are very low. Some of your things that you have on your uh, drive through RPG are even zero. Um, and yeah. uh, some of the rules lights things are like a dollar or a couple a couple of dollars and it uh, looks like it's super affordable to get into uh, Stella Gamma Publishing's you know product line again we are trying to price our products in the fairest way possible and for this we have to be very uh, frugal we very tight with our budget with mm-hmm. our art budget uh, again once we go to the Kickstarter we could have, have all the color art we want which was the only way we could finance it of course we also pay artists uh, full prices and uh, we provide everyone with with a fair share of our uh, profits. 
how hard is it to uh, get into Kickstarter? Um, and how was your Kickstarter? Have you done Kickstarters before? No. Actually, I had to work with an American partner because mm -hmm. they can't open Kickstarter or even Indiegogo from Israel because of bureaucracy. They work with Stripe as a clearing and payment processor, and they're stuck in some bureaucratic process in Israel in their licensing. So I have to work with a partner who opens the Kickstarter and runs it and then uh, takes a certain commission, but it's still worth it. I never even thought of that as a job, you know, to be like a Kickstarter. Uh, it's not um, a job, it's it's partnership with another publisher, essentially. Gotcha. But still, it's uh, we finally found the right partner to work mm -hmm. with, which is Menagerie Press, and they uh, did the Kickstarter, of course, in close collaboration with us, and it reached quite a nice sum of money which mostly went to art <laughs> especially deck pens because you know it's professional work did you meet your goal i mean obviously sounds like you met your goal did you go past your goal and uh, get overfunded we reached we reached uh, two stretch goals actually uh or extensions or whatever they're called um yes. uh, yeah okay two extensions yeah. it was quite successful and again, we, we now learned how to do it a better way in terms of accounting and planning. And we are planning another Kickstarter for this summer for the second edition of Barbaric, the sorcery uh, rule set, the lighter sword and sorcery rule set, which is going to be awesome because I'm now writing the second edition rules for it. And there are a lot of cool stuff we are putting in it. We are making it tighter. We are making magic more interesting. It's also based on the quantum engine. Is Barbaric like a, a light version of a sort of Cepheus, or, or is it just uh, uh, no, focusing on like Conan style? Sword of Cepheus also is Conan style, but it's a very, very different rules engine. Basis of 2d6. Uh-huh. But uh, the Sword of Cepheus is based on Cepheus Light, full-blown rule set uh, with a detailed skill system and uh, characteristics and everything. And Barbaric is a much simpler system. We call it Beer and Pretzels uh, approach to gaming. It's very, uh, again, it's simple, it's fast play, it's aimed on shorter campaigns for the most part. You could also run a very long campaign with it, but uh, the focus is uh, on short-term action, and uh, it's very lightweight. I right. know people who introduce their children to gaming through it. Yeah, no, that's that's nice because uh, uh, I don't have kids, but I'm an uncle, and uh, I like to uh, you know bring new new people in and bring kids on and teach kids games. You know, have fun. Uh, we have uh, family game night on Fridays, and uh, we play board games, or we'll play uh, we'll play adventure games card games, you know, whatever. I think it's important to um, instill, you know, a uh, sense of fair play and um, taking your turn and patience and creativity and all the things that, uh, you know, gaming can bring to your life as a, as a kid. Yes, because uh, I had someone tell me that they introduced their kids to gaming through Barbaric because they say it, it's, it clicked with them much faster than Dungeons and Dragons. It's a much simpler system. The basic idea is simply you distribute a few points between your skills and then you roll uh, to the 6 plus, plus your skill and for, for target number and or greater. Once you get this, everything is simple. Do you get a lot of fan mail like that telling uh, you how? Mostly on social media. Uh, it must be... Uh, must feel rewarding very rewarding so let's talk about the uh, open gaming license thing uh, Wizards of the Coast for folks who don't know Wizards of the Coast was going to revoke their open gaming license which is what a lot of us indie publishers uh, are developing under that's what I develop under for using the SRD the system reference document anyway Wizards of the Coast was going to revoke that and I guess that would revoke it across the board and there was no way to just like keep it and you know use the older version or rework it or whatever it was up in the air what the future of of our indie development for traveler offshoots was going to be so how did that affect you the the open gaming license uh, problem with uh, wizards of the coast and how did you end up uh, how did you how did you end up adapting to it and, and uh... see in the end they withdrew from it but we are also withdrawing as much as possible from the ogl because if they did it once they could do it again so we're moving to uh, creative commons license share alike and uh, everything like that simply 
accessible rules. The damage was much smaller than anticipated again because they withdrew. But the fruits of this were that uh, we had uh, the entire Cepheus community, Cepheus publisher community, uh, negotiated with Mongoose Publishing and we are tentatively getting a compatibility license. Again, this was announced by Mongoose Publishing online on the forum and they are working out the details but this will allow us to create uh, versions of all our titles uh, other than the rule books which we don't have to use but all the supplements and settings for Mongoose, Mongoose Traveler the second edition the updated second edition which is which is a very good thing it's uh, everyone has to gain from this it's a win-win situation initially the plan was to circumvent the entire OGL thing by Mongoose uh, Publishing using uh, as a black, no, not black flag, using the new system which was planned in the replacement for OGL, which is no longer, uh, which I think they're still developing it, but it's much less relevant. Uh, that the by, Pathfinder by people, the, the, yeah, by, by Pezo is uh, by going to. Mm-hmm. Again, I think by the Pezo is, are still developing it, but it's, it's much less, much less urgent right now because mm. the apocalypse was averted. Yes, yes, Wizards of the Coast withdrew their. Uh, uh, their intent to discontinue that I don't know but like you said if they did it before they can do it again and, and you don't want to have a heart attack every time they decide yeah. to uh, <laughs> pull their license so we better to just cut them out <laughs> yes executives circulate so mm-hmm. sooner or later someone with an MBA and no experience in gaming and no experience in the market we decide well we have to, to keep a tight lead on this IP and once again the entire thing it will happen most likely. Uh, again, not because uh, of bad intentions by many of the developers, but because some executives, uh, they, it's a company like any other company, and people who are businessmen and not gamers necessarily. Right. So they make business decisions, sometimes they miss a point which was exactly what happened uh, in January. Yeah, it caused a big outrage um, because a lot of people develop for uh, D&D on that license and uh, D&D variations. I mean, that that was a bigger market share than, you know, who who the people that are developing under, you know, the Traveler license. But it upset a lot of people. (laughs) People uh, boycotted stuff. and yeah, profits uh, because a lot of people canceled canceled the subscriptions to D&D Beyond. Yep. There was a lot of bad press for them but again it might it may happen again sooner or later again because of business considerations and lack of mm-hmm. experience in some cases by, by executives this is why our long term plan is to move to creative commons whenever possible not in Cepheus because Cepheus is under the open gaming license uh, there will even be a new SRD for Mongoose Traveler 2nd edition but we are thinking about a percentile system mm-hmm. based on open quest if you know the system no I haven't heard of that it's an open content uh, creative commons version of uh, RuneQuest essentially okay. uh, not exactly version it's a descendant of uh, or evolution okay. of RuneQuest. And we are thinking about creating a science fiction version of the system using the open license, the Creative Commons license, actually. And this will allow us to work free of all the risks of OGL. This will be called Cradle of Stars, and uh, we are working on it for the long term. Now it's not very urgent. I've so played a f- we had to, we had to mm-hmm. complete it by the summer, but it's now, right now it's not very urgent. I've played a few uh, percentile systems. Um, the ones that jump to mind would be Top Secret and uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I think those are both great mechanics, and uh, you know, I don't know why they're mo- not more popular. Well, of Cthulhu is extremely popular. I think it's the second most popular system. No, um, well, I meant I meant uh, games with the percentiles as their basis. I can only think of two <laughs> off the top of my head. Yes, Cthulhu and mm-hmm. Top Secret and Rune mm-hmm. Quest. And by the way, there is a new Warhammer 40k game which is also also the percentile system. It's called Imperium Mal- uh, Maledictum. It came out, I think, a few days ago. Yesterday, actually. Or the day before yesterday. So, uh, they're also using a percentile system. I have not bought it yet, but I uh, might look into it. Uh, but again, we are, we are thinking about science fiction percentile system and developing the quantum engine, which again is our system mm-hmm. we used to publish it under the ogl but it's not really based on the traveler srd 
Right. It's only inspired by this. It is uh, we are not taking traveler terminology or we are doing our own thing. So you've been at this for a while. Uh, what advice would you give other indie publishers who's just starting out in the tabletop industry? Start small. Start small. Especially without, because the cost could accumulate to large sums. Try to work simply and uh, plan your budget well. Create content which is attractive to customers, which is mainly rule books and settings. Adventures we had a much more mixed experience with, by the way, because adventures are bought only by the referee, by the game master, and not all game masters want pre-prepared adventures, so they sell less than rule books, and they sell less than setting material and source books, because this, what people really want, it appears, are uh, source books of all kinds. We do some third-party source books for other systems like Stars Without Number, which are very, very popular. Again, start small. Don't try to overdo yourself. It's a business. A very different mindset for pen, uh, fan publishing because you have to make a profit and you have to pay your bills. I'm not working full-time in publishing right now, by the way. I'm working part-time, unfortunately, but looking forward to working full-time. Uh, you're yes. doing better, uh, more sales than you did last year and the year before, right? So yes. it's, it won't be long. In a, in a few years, I will be able to support myself by gaming. Uh, I'm a f I'm behind you on the on the timeline <laughs> by a few years, but uh, little by little uh, things are uh, are growing for the indie publishers. Yeah, and Kickstarters could be very very useful if you plan them right. But Kickstarter is a lot of work, a uh, lot of work. In, in what, even, in what... even if you are in the US and you don't need bureaucratic arrangement around it, you have to take care of it. You have to take care of. Uh, Backers and customers. Mm, oh, so there's like a maintenance uh, cost to it in time, is you know, like answering emails and yes, management. It, it's it's much more customer service than regular publishing. You have because people are backing it and they want certain products and certain ideas what products they wanted, and we have to satisfy everyone, which again is a lot of work, uh, some administrative work. Uh, on the other hand, if you run it right, it could really allow you to put out amazing things. Did you feel like maybe the community might have uh, taken you in a direction that you didn't originally intend to go with that, with the thing that you're putting up for Kickstarter? No, we okay. worked on a plan. We just had to make sure that everyone stays happy with it. Mm, I see. Stays focused on what your end product vision was. Yes. Okay. So how do you promote uh, your products? Um, how, how do new players find out about your stuff? Um, what brings new new players into your game, and how do you uh, keep uh, and how do you reach older players? Uh, I mean, pl pe not older players, but players who've been playing your game longer than new players. First and foremost, we are active on social media, uh, but also we already accumulated a list of customers who bought some of our products, and we send them updates about new products, uh, usually with a discount. So you have a mailing list? Um, can yes. That, okay. So drive through RPG. It's a very large mailing list, thousands of people. And every time we put out something new, we send them a discount code as returning customers. This they are really interested interested in our titles and this permits us to sell quite well again to reach people who are already interested in our products already experienced with our production quality returning customers are quite a bit of our customer base but not only well you need to uh, bring new people in right to uh, keep your customer base yes. growing so how, how do you norm how do you do that through, to, to, social, through, social, through media. social media outreach well active in all uh, traveler communities we know, in other OSR communities. By the way, we put out uh, also D20 OSR game recently called Gargoyle, which is, uh, I think, one of the most suitable OSR games for my taste. Mm. Not it's also, I'm only its uh, publisher, but it's, it's uh, perfect for my rule slide uh, approach. I saw it I listed in your catalog. Yes, it's already mm. in my catalog, it's called, called Gargoyle. Mm -hmm. It even has one adventure. You will soon have a monster book, monster supplement. We're working on it. It works alongside Barbaric and the Sword of Cepheus and all other uh, titles we publish. Let's talk about virtual tabletops and online gaming. Um, with uh, you know the pandemic, and everything uh, going on still people are turning to um, virtual tabletops so how do you see the tabletop industry evolving in the future especially with the rise of virtual tabletop platforms 
players, they usually play online nowadays. Uh, it's much easier to organize this because even in a small country like Israel, people are still several hours of driving away from each other in some cases. Uh, so uh, we game online, it's very easy to organize. Uh, we use the Roll20, and we are thinking about moving to uh, Foundry, which is more customizable and doesn't have a monthly subscription fee. Uh, but it's more complex to set up. You have to set up a server, and uh, I'm still looking into the technicalities of it. Most of our games have modules on Foundry. There is a module for all Traveler and the uh, 2D6 systems uh, on uh, Foundry called 2D6. Yes, I've played that. It's it's awesome. Whoever made that, uh, kudos to you, Super Kev or whatever. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, there are several people. There is the entire team, pen team, mm. are working on it for free. And uh, we have module for Gargoyle as well. Yeah, I played the 2D6 and I was uh, very pleased with it. You can set it to um, to show uh, effect level, which is nice because yeah. as the GM, I'm, I don't really care if they're hitting the target number. I want to know what the effect is. And so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's, you can get into like the settings for your game and say, show me the effects. The effects can automatically be applied to weapon damage. I mean, it's pretty slick. And um, yeah, so it's already adapted to all our. Uh, to the six systems and this is something we are proud of we also hired a programmer to, to develop a character sheet and a ship sheet for Cephas Deluxe on Roll20 this is a more complex work uh, for what I understand uh, it's more complex on the technical side and more difficult to develop so we hired someone to do it yes uh, I'm uh, an experienced programmer and, and web page designer and when I took a look at uh, the roll 20s character sheet designer it was a brain scrambling nightmare but uh, they've uh, they've improved their tools since then I haven't uh, seen them so I don't know how good they are yes but still it's, it's something you have to invest a lot of money because you need a professional for it. Uh, this is not something fans can develop easily uh, like in Foundry, which is much more friendly. But again, a lot of our games get played online, I think. Going forward, are you going to try to um, keep VTT in mind when producing um, uh, products? Like, uh, let's say you, you have your superhero game or, or CFS or whatever. When you when you put that out, do you think, oh, we need some like starship counters with this, or we need some things that will help facilitate uh, VTT gaming, or do you just use the approach of you know people will just use the markers and things that they already we have? Are, we are also working on deck plans for CFS Deluxe. The new deck plans in the enhanced edition of CFS Deluxe are already prepared for VTT use, but not all our older deck plans. So we're working on that as well, because uh, this is uh, one thing people really want much more than uh, tokens. If you publish maps, they want to use the maps online, so you have to cut them in the right way, so they, they work well with Roll20 especially. I think in Foundry, some of the deck plans are already implemented in the repository, but I'm not sure, because I let them do it. <laughs> right, right, okay. It's very uh, useful for people because, again, people are playing online, from my experience, much more than uh, face to face. Do you I think that? To play face to face, but realistically, it's much easier to organize an online game. Um, where I live is uh, rural, and uh, it's hard to bring people together because, like you say, everybody lives so far away from each other. For us, VTT has been um, even good for adding some local players into our into the game that that we play with uh, folks from internationally. You know. Uh, it's been a great, great invention in, um, from my perspective as a player and a GM. Internationally, the only problem is time zones, but we can play with Europe without much problem. Mm -hmm. One hour, hour or two hour difference, usually. Right. Um, with the US, it's much more complex to play, but I know, I know people who play from Israel to, and, and from the US in the same game. Yeah, when you have the whole world as your player pool, you're more likely to find people yeah. with uh, schedules that mesh, right? Yeah. Let's talk about some current events and stuff. How do you incorporate current events and tech trends like the rise of AI, for instance, in your sci-fi games? Do you have do you have rules for AI? Can you play AI characters? Are there like uh, robots and things like that um, in your games? We have, we have a robots book mm -hmm. for uh, Quantum Starfare, by the way. But uh, we take a very cautious approach about AI because uh, we also see its limitations. It tried some of the AI engines, ChatGPT, 
and uh, mid journey and you could see their limitations because it's not self-aware it's some kind of algorithm which you train on existing material and then it knows how to mix that remix this material so we had uh, something in most of our sci-fi books called virtual intelligence simulated intelligence actually not virtual uh, which means that it looks like an intelligence it behaves like intelligence but it's not really self-aware my belief belief is that real ai is quite far in the future that's General been my AI. experience too I, I feel like people are freaking out about like chat gpt but really it's like a sophisticated mad libs yes, generator it's, it's very sophisticated but it doesn't it has no imagination it simply remixes existing material. It is simply a huge database of material and works very fast. But people were freaking out about Eliza in the 60s, so... Right, I remember that. Uh, and how do you feel today? And uh, I feel sick. And tell me more about feeling sick. And uh, yes. now we have those uh, replica... It's code. Mm -hmm. it's code is very, very simple. Yeah, it's that was... Simple, it gives you... But people, uh, you know, the Turing test is very easy to cheat. So now we have very complex cheaters for the mm -hmm. Turing test, but they're not really passing it. For example, I tried to ask ChatGPT to create traveler characters. It created something close to a traveler character, but doesn't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Because it simply took, I think, web pages of characters people put online and processed them in some way. It remixed them. But get to an AI, which is a person, which is self-aware, uh, thinks there is some kind of uh, roadblock ahead of us. By the way, the things we call AI are not really AI, you know, it's right. data mining. Sure, sure. The machine learning, but machine learning is a new term for data mining. Gotcha. Uh, yes. It's a matter of having a fast computer working on a huge database. And so, so if you have... extrapolate that, you know, over time into the future, you have future really super fast computers. And so you can simulate intelligence easily because you have a much bigger computing power in a much smaller package exactly but it's mm -hmm. not it doesn't replace people really AIs are also a problem in gaming because you don't want to automate everything in the universe you have a place for player characters or human for the or organic alien uh, so we take a very cautious approach do you uh, normally uh, use them for like maybe foils or bad, you know, uh, insane AIs or running the space station or an insane? Well, Why is there always an insane AI? <laughs> Why can't they just be normal? It's easier to have a simulated intelligence uh, hacked by someone to behave like as an AI than having an actual AI because it's extremely easy to manipulate these things. General terms for this requires skills, but once you're skilled, you could manipulate the system and get it to do your bidding or to behave in crazy ways. You can, people were exper already experimenting with ChatGPT and getting a lot of very weird things from it. Yes, they had to put safety protocols in place. Yes, same with the journeys, uh, preventing people from making porn with it. Mm, yes, right. People figure out very quickly they could do it. Right, right. But again, we are very cautious with the AI. We have rules for robots and for Androids. In all of our books, there are even a system to construct them and see if it's deluxe, if you want to create. Uh, but real uh, intelligence bots are very, very high-tech and expensive. This also goes end in the end with our traveler heritage, which again is very monocentric and anthropocentric and very uh, pessimistic about AI and robots. Yes, I have my uh, robot book. I've been clinging to my original travel <laughs> robot book. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at your robot book or the one from that uh, Mongoose just put out, uh, I guess last year or six months ago or whatever. I can't wait though, because uh, I really, I like robots. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere in Star Wars. So, uh, you know, people like to bring those kinds of pop culture uh, things into their game. Uh, robots yeah. are just staple part of sci-fi, right? I mean, really. Yes, and we have them in our core books. It's our system for creating them, but uh, again, they are not the focus of the game. So let's talk more about um, CVS Deluxe Enhanced Edition. So what is that and how does it differ from the other versions of uh, CVS and CVS? We rewrote it essentially from the basis to make it more approachable, as, much, as approachable as possible for people who are unfamiliar with Traveler. A lot of it came from playtester feedback, which we listened to. Uh, this means we don't have desert character generation, uh, only optionally if people want to go hardcore 
with uh, we we have a non-random character generation by default simpler starship and vehicle combat systems uh, which are based on chase essentially and uh, not on the uh, map positions because we found this much more attractive to our players uh, we simplified armor rules and we simplified a lot of rules and we added a lot of random tables to generate content and encounters which i think is our uh, best thing and we added examples to every major rule system oh good that's uh, very helpful for the user Yes, and this is something people really like about our systems. That was a big um, thing I, I, uh, I appreciated in the hero system. It used to be like, well, it still is really complicated to uh, figure out like your superpower points and uh, champions. But then yeah. they started putting together little packages and putting them in the margin along with how much the skill cost. So you could just browse, you know, if you're in the elemental control area, you could see oh, here's a package of 100 points or here's one of 50 points and you could just use these pre, pre-built pre kind of packages. So that was those examples of how to put those things together and already have them available for you really sped up the NPC creation process and the, also creating PCs too. So um, yeah, it's nice to see those, uh, to see publishers um, kind of uh, accommodate their their readers, especially with things that could be complicated and, and give good yeah. good examples. My character generation in the CFUs. Mm-hmm. But everything is an example, a detailed example, or even two examples in some cases, three examples, depends on the, on the chapter. Again, it's focused on new players. We had some pulp options, like hero points. It's optional, but uh, if you want to play it more Star Wars style, you could do it. It will still be grittier than uh, ordinary Star Wars, but uh, if you want heroics, you have the option. Uh, on the other hand, you could go to a much uh, more gritty uh, approach. And we intend to publish several supplements for it, especially adventures. We are working on a few. Uh, eventually move to our personal system and focus more on the uh, quantum engine. So let's talk uh, about uh, Quantum Starfarer. Uh, um, how yes. does it? How is it different from uh, Cepheus uh, Deluxe? It's much simpler system. It's a. Uh, it only has uh, seven skills. No characteristics. You simply distribute points between your skills. Between the skills, you have uh, seven skills. You distribute five points between them. Maximum three in one of them. This is character creation. You had a simple uh, stamina system for uh, damage. And the rules themselves are very simple. Again, it's the only thing it has in common with Cepheus is the 2d6 plus skill versus target number. But otherwise, it's very, uh, it's very much its own thing. Uh, let's talk about uh, your flagship setting, uh, Terra Arisen, which uh, is formerly These Stars Are Ours. How has it evolved since its initial release? Uh, what made you uh, also? What made you change the name? Uh, we wanted to create something new and much more focused. Uh, because uh, what we wanted is less uh, fluff, less lore and history and more adventure hooks. Because when you publish something like that, people are going to play it around the table and they're not going to read through too many pages of background unless this background is very relevant to their game. Uh, this is our experience. So we took a lot of care to make sure that everything has plot hooks in it. The rule is at least one plot hook for per uh, paragraph. Sometimes even two or three. And we also wanted to adapt the rules to Cepheus Deluxe because the original rules for, were for the Cepheus Engine SRD. Uh, so we, sh- we updated the rules. We updated the art. Uh, it's similar size of the book, similar length, but uh, much more focused and re-edited. We mm-hmm. sort of worked to it. And it includes more space. It is more uh, star systems. Double oh. the amount of star systems. Uh, then uh, the stars are ours. Again, it's uh, a very focused setting, very play focused. Uh, gives you all the cool stuff you need for it and uh, directly compatible with Cepheus Deluxe. So it sounds like uh, you you do pay attention uh, to your customer feedback and incorporate it into uh, various editions and, 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 and exactly. entire product lines. It's- Customer yeah. and play tester. Mm-hmm. It's very important to listen to people in our line of work. Let's talk a little bit about your philosophy for your approach to making uh, engaging and immersive sci-fi uh, settings or campaigns. I-, I know you said that maybe adventures are the uh, lowest seller. H- how do you develop your your campaign setting and make it interesting for people? 
we have to look at it through the lens of the gaming table. Because we are not writing a sci-fi novel and we are not engaging in uh, world building experiences. We are writing something people will have to use. So when you design the setting, you have to think uh, about a very good uh, frame of reference, which will set up the game. It also goes for uh, other media, but for gaming it's especially important. So there uh, we had it uh, set immediately after a war. Most characters fought in that war. And they know each other from there. They have the, the war paints everything and so on. And we made sure that there are a lot of stuff to do in the setting. A lot of conflicts. Conflicts are always good for gaming. I think that the best settings are ones in which you could jump into action as quickly as possible and experience the settings. It's, they say, don't tell show. And when designing sci-fi settings, again, we think we design them for gaming. So we think about what will be interesting for people to play in, what will make good adventures. The settings themselves have to be, uh, again, focused. And we are thinking, again, we are thinking, so what would be fun to play at the table? Which is different from a novel or TV series. The focus is very different because the players behave differently from uh, literary heroes. Right, in most right. cases, they interested in different things. And you have to engage with the audience. Right, and they're, they're, uh, you never know where the story is really going to go. I mean, you can just give them a set, uh, a scenario and then see where it kind of goes because uh, everybody's going to be playing off of each other and um, just, uh, like you say, make sure there's engaging things. And it sounds like uh, you've addressed that in your books. I mean, you have, like you said, plot hooks uh, throughout. You have conflicts. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things to do. So... Um, uh, I think uh, GMs could uh, approach your setting pretty easily and, uh, and 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 get their games going. Yes, we also don't have a progressing meta plot. This is something I learned from other RPGs, uh, like Shadowrun, which had the most the coolest stuff going on in the second edition, and then mm -hmm. they simply resolved it. And the replacement was not as good, I think. Uh, so in Terra Reason, we simply uh, open up the setting for the referee and the players. Uh, after the, once the setting starts, we are not going to advance the timeline. Mm -hmm. This is something you do at your table. We, because we also don't want to say, well, your adventure was not canonical. Uh, the canon says that uh, this and that. And yeah, that... So we, again, this is uh, in favor of the players and the referees. Can you um, share any details about upcoming releases or projects that you have in the works and what players can expect from them? Uh, yes. First and foremost, we are working on Barbaric 2nd Edition, uh, which is rebalanced based on uh, player feedback and having a cooler magic system, I think. This will go on Kickstarter on July, on the coming July. After that, we are working on something called the uh, High Octane Sorcery, which okay. is a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk a sword and sorcery or blast, uh, shotgun and sorcery a setting and rule book based on the quantum engine. It's uh, more Conan meets Mad Max than Shadowrun, uh -huh. anyways, uh, in its tone. But uh, this, we hope to have a Kickstarter for it around December or January. We still have to work on it and uh, we have to fulfill the previous Kickstarter b before we start a new one. Okay. But uh, we are working on these two things and on the longer run we are working on Cradle of Stars which is a percentile system for science fiction which is on setting and on approach. And we are publishing Gargoyle and Supplements, which are a D20 OSR game, very lightweight. Again, very focused on play and very extensively playtested. The guy awesome. who wrote it is uh, running games uh, as his profession. So everything got playtested uh, very, very extensively. We are publishing several supplements for it, several adventures. And there will be soon uh, two or three new adventures for uh, Terra Reason. Uh, and we are hoping to create more, even more generic adventures for uh, Cephas Deluxe. And in the longer term, also a second edition of the Third of Cephas. Fantastic. You've got a lot on your plate. <laughs> yes, but not work. I'm talking about two years into the future. So uh -huh. there are seven, two Kickstarters in the coming year, and then we'll see where we go. 
Fantastic. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Where's the best uh, way to uh, find out more about your products and purchase them? You could find us on uh, Drebs RPG, search for Stellagama Publishing, uh, or look for us on Facebook. We update our page uh, quite often. Uh, you could follow us on Facebook, Stellagama Publishing, and see we get all the updates. We post sometimes every week uh, about new stuff. You could find us on the Traveler Discord and our own Discord server. You could find us uh, on the Cepheus Engine uh, Facebook group. And uh, let me see, if if people want to get on your drive through RPG mailing list, they could, for instance, download the random character generator for Cepheus, which is zero amount, and uh, get on your mailing list that way. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us for our fifth annual May Day, May Day 2023 event. Um, I've been really happy to uh, put these together and super happy that guests were willing to come and um, sit with these uh, interviews. So thanks for your partici participation basically since the beginning. You're welcome. All right, then. Um, I guess that uh, concludes our interview. So thank you so much. Hey. Thank you for listening to our podcast with Omer Golanjol. We hope you've enjoyed hearing about his experience as a game designer and his latest projects. Don't forget to check out his popular role-playing games, such as Terra Arisen, Barbaric, and Quantum Starfarer. And, of course, a huge thank you to Omer for taking the time to speak with us. Until next time, my friends, happy traveling.